Uh, we'd like to turn to Teddy Potter, who's known to many of you. Teddy from Minnesota has had a tremendous impact on climate health education at the University of Minnesota. She's an activist at the national level, at the international level. Uh, she spoke at our very first annual meeting. Uh, she's absolutely a stalwart, and we are delighted uh, to welcome her today. Thank you, Mona. It's my honor to be part of this um, session and be guiding you to hear wonderful experts from around the world. I am going to um, ask to have the next slide, please. So when we think of education, a lot of you uh, think about school buses and K-12 education or perhaps university education. And what we want to make clear in this session is um, on the next slide, please that we'll be talking about education for everyone. Everyone needs to be informed about climate change and um, the health impacts of climate change. Next slide, please. So we're fortunate to have um, leaders and speakers um, today. I'm just going to briefly introduce them. Carla Hampshire is a fourth year medical student at the University of California, San Francisco. And she's the founder and co-director of the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative. Helen Fahm graduated from Malloy College in the spring of 2020. She's a cardiovascular and thoracic intensive care unit uh, registered nurse at Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan. Lisa Patel is a cl uh, clinical assistant professor of pediatrics at Stanford School of Medicine. And she's the former presidential uh, management fellow for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, Cecilia Sorensen is the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia University. And last but not least is Arthur Wynn, um, who is going to be, or who is the policy manager of the Climate and Health Alliance. Um, uh, and he consults for the World Health Organization. So we will start with the next slide, please. And that is welcoming Carly. Next slide. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. And, and thank you for the introduction, Dr. Potter. So I'll be setting the stage for the other great speakers lined up this morning with a student's perspective on why climate and health should be included in the curriculum and some of the student-led advocacy efforts underway to manifest that goal. And the picture in the backdrop of the slide actually helps illustrate the gap between current medical education and the health threats our communities are facing pretty well. Um, this was what this guy looked like when I started medical school in the fall of 2018 as the campfire was raging in Northern California, perhaps a familiar sight for some of you. And though we were walking to school every day in N95 masks, breathing in some of the worst quality air in the world, our lecturers did not acknowledge the health effects of air pollution or wildfire smoke in our curriculum, which is especially notable given that we were in our pulmonary block at the time. So it felt like a real missed opportunity to talk about the ever-growing health consequences of climate change. Next slide. And I soon found that other students were as disillusioned as I was with the lack of climate change in medical school curriculum. In a student survey of about 600 medical students across the country we led, 84% believed that climate health was needed in the core curriculum, but only 13% believed that their medical school was providing adequate education on the topic. And perhaps most striking was that only 6% of surveyed students felt very prepared to discuss climate change and health with a patient. And this lack of confidence in communicating climate change and health is a problem because we know based on research led by Ed Maybach and others that health professionals are some of the most trusted sources for climate health information and in some surveys more than even the CDC and climate scientists. So patients want us to have this information, but the truth is that health professional students are not trained to understand, manage, or mitigate the health consequences of climate change. Next slide. Luckily though, there is a lot of momentum to understand and address this gap and one source of momentum is the Planetary Health Report Card Initiative, which is a student-led metric-based initiative to increase planetary health engagement in health professional schools that I co-founded alongside several classmates at UCSF back in 2019. So the report card catalyzes student-led teams to conduct a planetary health need assessment at their medical schools and evaluate their institution on various metrics. Students can then work with faculty and administrators to address the gaps identified gaining inspiration from efforts at other schools through our report card repository, our idea sharing events like the Institutional Advocacy Workshop and Annual Symposium um, and our active online community. Next slide. So to get a little bit more into the details, the report card is divided into five sections. 
curriculum, research, community outreach and advocacy, support for student-led initiatives, and sustainability, with some examples shown here. And for each metric, students select a point tier and then write out an explanation of why that point tier was selected. So therefore, the written report card can serve as a comprehensive resource for those interested in exploring the institution's offerings on planetary health. Next slide. When we started this initiative in 2019 as a pilot at just UCSF and Stanford, we didn't know if there would be student interest. But the initiative quickly grew to include 13 medical schools in 2020 to 62 medical schools last year. And for this year's cycle, the results of which will be published pretty soon on, on World Earth Day, so stay tuned. Um, we have teams at over 70 medical schools in the US, UK, Canada, Ireland, Germany, and Japan. And there are some exciting future directions in store. So in the coming years, we plan to continue expanding the report card scope to additional medical schools and countries with expansion already in the works in India, Australia, New Zealand, Switzerland, and South Africa. Um, and another exciting update, as of last week, pilots have been launched for nursing and pharmacy programs. Um, and special shout out to Dr. Potter, our esteemed moderator, who helped lead the nursing metric development and even found a way to give her students course credit for being involved. Um, and Dr. Potter likes to share the proverb, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and I hope this type of interprofessional collaboration will propel the climate health curriculum movement even further. Next slide. And of course, people always wanna know how the report card has actually helped catalyze real change since that's all of our end goal. Um, and though we haven't historically done a great job of collecting comprehensive data on that, I'll be honest, um, we do know that as a result of involvement with the report card, many schools have developed planetary health task forces or boards. Some have launched student groups or environmental electives and others have had lasting permanent changes made to their curricula. Um, and next slide. And a lot of what we do with the Planetary Health Report Card Network is crowdsource information on what are the barriers that you're encountering with integrating this content and what are the best practices that you found for overcoming them? So how can we learn from each other's experiences? So with that goal in mind, we'll share some of what we have found thus far. Um, first barriers, uh, a lot of the barriers are related to lack of resources, lack of faculty expertise, lack of funding, lack of curricular space. And from the student side, there's also this sense of I already have to learn so much to become a health professional. There's already this fire hose of information coming at me. How can I add this to when it's not even tested on my licensing exams? So some of the best practices that we found for addressing these barriers are one, integrating climate and health into existing curricula. So where you're already talking about vector-borne diseases, throw in a slide or two about the changing geographic distribution of vectors due to climate change. And when you're already talking about structural determinants of health, use redlining and heat as an example. This curricula doesn't require brand new standalone lectures. And in fact, I found it's more effective if it's integrated. So it's not as existentially overwhelming for students and it's better reflective of the broad pervasive health consequences of climate change. Faculty and student co-production of knowledge is also helpful. So students can bring energy and a valuable student perspective. Faculty bring clinical knowledge and longevity, ensuring that curricular transformation is sustainable. Another facilitator is thinking about how institutions can crowdsource curricular materials when possible, catalyzing more urgent curricular transformation and avoiding having to reinvent the wheel at each different institution, um, especially given that many institutions don't yet have faculty experts in climate and health. And in that vein, Dr. Sorensen will be talking later about the Climate Resources for Health Education open access repository that we're working on. And then lastly, getting top-down support within your institution from people like your curriculum deans helps overcome barriers. And at a larger scale with top-down support, um, Dr. Patel will be talking about efforts to obtain top-down support nationally to get this content included in license, license, licensing exams um, and formal accreditation requirements. So I think those two sneak previews of the presentations to come are a good stopping point. Um, thank you so much and look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Thank you so much, Carly. And nothing gets a dean moving faster than getting a C or a D on this report card compared to the other schools in the nation. So it's a great leverage point. And thank you for all your leadership, Carly, in this effort. Um, next, we have Helen Baum talking about her work. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this wonderful panel of speakers. 
Uh, as healthcare professionals, not just registered nurses, we really do have a unique voice and a duty to amplify each other's voices. And it's never too early or too late to get involved. I first got involved as a nursing student when I learned about the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments at a National Nursing Students Conference. And through a and &E, um, I was able to do some really awesome advocacy work in Washington, DC. As a student, I served as the President Community Health Director for the Nursing Students Association of New York State, uh, where I collaborated with like-minded individuals who wanted to make an impact in our communities. Um, being such my favorite was organizing beach cleanups, and I organize one every year for our community. And although it may be difficult due to time constraints and adjusting to our professional careers, it's incredibly important for us to be agents of change and continuing to facilitate these climate talks within the profession. Um, as a new nurse, I've only been a, new, a nurse for two years. I graduated in 2020. Um, it is difficult because while you're adjusting to your new job, um, or if you're in school, your priorities will either be your education or your job, but it's also important to kind of cor in, uh, incorporate um, time to do the advocacy work. Next slide. So this slide features um, a climate strike walk in New York City. Uh, Greta Thunberg, I'm sure we're very familiar with her. Um, this was a really awesome event. There were 4 million attendees from varying ages, but mostly students. And it was really awesome to see so many young faces fighting for their future and our future. And um, pictured is my sister with me with our homemade signs. And it was just such a beautiful event to see um, so many students so passionate. Next slide. So through my work with a Annie, uh, Jane F this event, Jane Fonda was inspired by Greta Thunberg and organized Fire Drill Fridays. And um, the thought is that we can't just continue in living our lives because our house is on fire, hence Fire Drill Fridays. Uh, so this particular event, as you can see in the middle top photo, um, this was more geared towards for nurse, registered nurses. So in this photo, we have nurses from all over the country, including Nevada, California, Texas, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and we all came together for this particular Friday dressed in our white lab coats and our red berets to stand out and show our uniform, unified voices. We were a sea of white and red and in the crowd, as you can see in the top right photo, we have this little hero in wearing a vote to protect my little lungs. So not just adults, but we had kids there and it was really, really awesome. And while in DC, we also met with several Congresswomen and men to advocate to support uh, green solutions, sitting down and having meetings. I met with my local Congressman, Thomas Swazi, and the incredible Congresswoman, Lauren Underwood, his, who is also a registered nurse. And I left a, her quote right here. She said on her page, she said, more than ever, we need nurses, and I think other medical professionals as well, to step forward into leadership positions. So if you are able to, and you're considering a leadership position, I say do it because we need more people like us and we need more people to make changes. Um, and I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes. Michael J. Fox once said, if you want to be an agent of change, it starts with you and what you're made of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. And as you can all see, uh, climate activism does not have to be boring and it does not have to be rote. It can be um, very, very creative and um, a way of bringing people together. And that's actually where you have the most power and potential is when you come together. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. Next slide. Our next speaker will be Lisa Patel. Thanks so much for having me. You can advance to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our efforts to get um, climate and health information into our American Board of Pediatrics, part of our certification requirements. Next slide, please. Um, and where this really came from, I just wanna build off of what Carly and her um, medical student colleagues created, which is really a movement in medical education that we as pediatricians were, were watching. And the efforts to include this information in pediatrics dates back about 10 years ago. And we really felt this renewed sense of urgency thanks to, to the, the um, initiative that they created to try again um, on our board and see where we got. 
we happened to be very lucky because we reached out to the American Board of Pediatrics. And at the time, they were actually looking to generate new content and so found our entry point there. Next slide, please. So to be board certified in any medical specialty, there are often activities or exams that you have to take for us. And again, every single board is a little bit different. And so it'll be different from board to board. For, but for our particular board, there are four parts. And our entry point was the second part where you have to do sort of a question and answer module. So what we were able to do, and again, we were lucky within um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, we had a very large network of pediatricians that have been very concerned about the climate crisis that have been organized by Lori Byron. So we saw this opportunity from the American Board of Pediatrics. We were able to go through our network very quickly and convene a working group to help put this module together. I was lucky to be joined by colleagues like Karina Maher, in addition to Lori Byron, Ruth Etzel, Anu Gorakanti, Sally Kaufman, Susan Pacheco, Jerry Paulson, Rebecca Phillips, Morning flank Thieben as well. Next slide, please. What we did, um, we got together in our working group. We, um, within our American Academy of Pediatrics, we actually have a very nicely laid out policy document that um, goes through all the health risks to children uh, in terms of climate change. We were able to use that to determine what our topics were going to be. We chose nine peer reviewed, re reviewed articles, wrote 20 questions, and these were the goals of our module, which was to understand how climate change affects children's health, understand the role fossil fuels um, play in terms of air pollution and climate change affecting children's health, and then understand the role of structural racism in terms of the disproportionate impacts of climate change. Once we wrote the module and had it approved by the American Board of Pediatrics, we used a little bit of our um, activism roots in terms of creating the social media graphics so that we could send it out across our networks so people under knew that this was an opportunity in terms of keeping up with their certification requirements. Next slide. What we uh, learned from the activity, we were hoping that the AAP could serve as somewhat of a model and help other boards try, try to include this information as well. And so what our next steps are um, is we're reaching out to other boards as well to see if we can integrate that information. We're also generating um, a new QI intervention within the MOC4, uh, which is another part of our certification activity for uh, pediatricians to understand how they can provide that climate change counseling in an office setting between patient and doctor. Um, and then we've reached out to the American Board of Medical Specialties, which is interested in reaching out to their boards. This year is a little bit challenging because there have been changes um, across all boards in terms of their certification requirements, but we're going to continue pushing there. And then the American um, Medical Association is actually going to be providing this module on their educational portal as well, so it will be accessible to more um, physicians across the country. What we learned here is that if at first you don't succeed, try and try again, even though 10 years ago um, they weren't quite ready for it. We found the right moment and the right opening and we just kept pressing our point. Having a concrete project within our society and amongst pediatricians really quickly mobilized excitement and support. Often we hear people say this problem feels so big and I don't know what to do. And so having a really concrete um, place or an entry point for people that are passionate about the issue helps mobilize people. And what we learned from that is now, once we created this MOC project, now there are lots of other educational projects that have sprung from that to keep people really going on this movement. Um, and then in advocating the board specialties, the message that we found most resonant in terms of integrating this information is to make it very directly clinically related and clinically tied, which was quite easy for us to do in pediatrics in terms of tying how climate change was affecting what pediatricians were seeing within their clinical walls. Thank you so much. presentation and we're all trying to head that direction so it always takes a very talented leader to get the ball rolling and we appreciate um, your your role modeling for us the next speaker is uh, Cecilia Sorensen thank you so much uh, Teddy it's really so inspiring to hear about all these initiatives um, next slide please so I am going to talk a little bit about the work of the global consortium on climate and health education uh, next slide please so as we all know, um, the Lancet Countdown has recently argued that you know, climate change is the biggest health threat of the 21st century, while at the same time, they argue that tackling climate change could be the biggest global health opportunity. However, in order to turn this risk or this threat into an opportunity, um, really what that bridge is, is a health workforce that is trained to prevent and respond to climate-related health issues. Next slide, please. 
So out of this need, the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education was formed in 2017. We recognize that climate change is a health crisis causing escalating impacts on communities worldwide while simultaneously widening health disparities and affecting society's ability to deliver health care. We know that there is an imperative for coordinated and rapid transformation of the health sector. However, there are critical knowledge gaps that exist at all levels of the health workforce, and we really seek to address these gaps. Next slide, please. So the mission and vision of the Global Consortium is to ensure that 100% of health professionals globally have the knowledge and skills to recognize, respond to, and prevent climate-related health impacts. And so to do this, we organize, empower, and amplify the voice of health professionals to convey how climate change is harming health, but also how climate solutions will improve it. Next slide, please. So as of now, we have over 250 um, member schools from over 40 different countries who have committed on the highest levels of their institutions um, to train their health professional students in climate and health. And this has really become um, a growing trend where we're getting more and more engagement across the world. We had a, a midwifery school from Turkey join yesterday. And so it's just incredible to see um, this across the world um, effort to kind of come together around these issues. Next slide, please. So the first question we really seek to address is how can we train health professionals to really be leaders in the response to the climate crisis? Next slide, please. So as one of our core functions, what we do is we create and iterate an evidence-based and highly vetted list of climate and health competencies for health professionals, which we hope can serve as a guide for both curricular development as well as programmatic development. And so these competencies cover climate and health knowledge and analytic skills, public health practice, clinical practice, policy aspects of climate change and health, and climate and health communication. And although these competencies are very general, um, we intend it to be that way because our hope is that we can engage as many different types of health professionals in this effort. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> when we're thinking about education, you know, a lot of times, you know, health professions um, really sort of stick to their specific silo. But when we think about what we really need is um, is a very interdisciplinary um, and responsive, um, you know, group of people coming together to address the climate crisis. So um, next slide, please. When we think about the, the roles and responsibilities of health professionals, when it comes to primary prevention of, of climate change, um, the core of this is really climate mitigation. Um, and so here, all health professionals have the shared responsibility to articulate the need for rapid decarbonization to policymakers, stakeholders, and the public, um, and simultaneously to build uh, resilience within the health sector. So here, the public health uh, professionals have the role of building the evidence base to understand complex interactions between climate change and population health, and clinical fields have the role to develop our understanding of how climate change impacts individual health and clinical practice. So what you can see is that, you know, um, specialists have sort of their own role within their own silos of healthcare, but there is this, this overlapping space where we need to work together. Next slide, please. The foundation of secondary prevention, we can really think about as being climate adaptation, whereby we seek to limit the harms of climate change. So here we see that the public health uh, professionals must take the lead in performing health impact assessments, vulnerability mapping, risk hazard assessments, and to building surveillance systems um, specific to climate related health threats. For secondary prevention, clinical fields must lead in creating and updating health system guidance as well as treatment plans for patients um, and additionally readying health systems. Together, all health professionals have this shared responsibility of establishing mechanisms to reduce health disparities as well as mobilizing the health voice to inform policies and identifying risks to critical health inf infrastructure. So again, we're seeing that um, individual health professions have, have roles within their sector, but then we also need to come together in this shared space to move things forward. Next slide, please. And then when we're thinking about tertiary prevention or reducing cascading health burdens once climate impacts, both acute and chronic have occurred, here really all disciplines must work together to establish and use best practices to coordinate interdisciplinary responses to compounding events. So while clinical fields must actively participate in disaster management and create systems to proactively respond to the needs of vulnerable patients, public health is, is needed to really mobilize partnerships and to identify and solve health problems and hazards in the community. Um, next slide, please. 
So what we can see is that this is really, you know, an effort that we need a lot of cooperation on throughout the health sector. And so to achieve this vision of an engaged and cooperative health system, we have invested in several types of initiatives. So as I mentioned before, first we obtain commitments from health professional schools to educate their students in climate and health practice. However, next, we also seek to increase the capacity of health institutions and existing professionals by partnering with, uh, with related health institutions to offer free courses, to offer grand round style lecture series, to create toolkits and more. And so what Carly Hampshire alluded to earlier is that we are working really hard right now to develop um, a database of uh, called the Climate, health, Climate Resources for Health Education which is going to be a website where there will be evidence-based peer-reviewed slides and uh, problem-based learning cases that can be used across, um, across health professional schools um, that can really be sort of this, this resource for rapid integration of climate and health content into existing curriculum. And not last but not least, um, you know, although we do a lot of work sort of on capacity building, we also seek to accelerate the transformation by providing, providing a platform for sharing and dissemination of best practices through our virtual town square, through our student committees, and through our member events. Um, it's important to know that membership with the consortium is completely free and open to all, um, as are all of our offerings. So um, we invite every institution, every, every member to join um, and contribute to our growing community of practice. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Cece. I can't say enough for the Global Consortium and that they have um, assembled rock solid, uh, peer reviewed, exceptional literature uh, to get all of us started in transforming our curriculum and making sure that practicing professionals and our students have access to climate change information. Um, so exceptional work, um, Cece, uh, and your organization is to be very much um, applauded. Um, the next speaker is Arthur Wynn. Good um, night from Australia, everybody. Hi, I'm Arthur Wins. I'm the policy manager of CAHA and I'm uh, calling in from Australia. Uh, it's 4 a.m. here. That's how much I want to be with uh, all of you. Uh, and I know we're a little bit over time. I only have three slides and I'm, I will be adding a bit of the international perspective to what we just uh, discussed. So my first slide that you see here is uh, a big global survey that we did of health professionals together with at Maybach and the George Mason University, which you've heard of just before. Um, and in this survey that we did, we um, surveyed thousands of health professionals from dozens of different countries um, on their views uh, on climate change and health. And we have a very good view, a uh, good sense already of what that looks like in the US and some other countries. But globally, in, in many different countries, we, we didn't really know yet um, what other health professionals were facing or how, how far they were with climate change and health. And the results of the survey were quite uh, astounding because the vast majority in the 90 plus percent of health professionals around the world really understood the dangers of climate change to health and were uh, very committed to engage in education and advocacy. So we were very impressed to getting such a clear and uniform message back from health professionals in, in countries that had never been uh, surveyed, surveyed before. Um, but we also found out that uh, a lot of health professionals are constrained uh, and I've listed the three sort of main constraints that came up time and time again. One is time, the other one is lack of knowledge or, or better put lack of formal education around this issue. Uh, and the third one, and there's quite a few others that also came up is a support, little support from peers. So the, the environment in which they operate is not very conductive to uh, include climate change in their work. Um, um, and not on this slide, but also very uh, interesting is that the survey also asked them what resources will be useful to address some of these barriers that you're facing uh, and what resources would you need to be more active on climate change and health. And quite a few came up time and again, including continuing professional education, uh, communications training, uh, patient education materials, policy statements, action alerts, uh, and guidance on how to make healthcare, uh, healthcare workplaces more um, sustainable. Um, next slide, please. So th that survey really showed that, um, although, of course, this is a very US focused meeting, uh, we're definitely not alone and, and um, the global health workforce is, is dealing with the same issues um, and potentially could benefit from the same kind of solutions. In this uh, second slide, I quickly want to touch on the value of also engaging health professionals in political processes. And, and like many of you, you, you'll be going to Congress on Monday, so I'm sure you, you're uh, with me on this one. 
Um, and here, there's a picture on the slide of COP26, and I know quite a few people in uh, this meeting and even some of the speakers uh, went to COP26, which was the, the UN climate change conference that took place in November last year. Uh, last year was in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and from a health community perspective, that it was a, a, quite a big success. Um, there was a broader, a bigger health community there than ever before. We were quite well organized and, and sort of building on ESC, Edscourt uh, at the start of this meeting, uh, the health community brought a, a clear, simple message with a variety of voices. So we did really make an impact. And also there was a lot of media engagement afterwards as well. Um, so um, we're hoping that we can repeat this. And this is on the international stage, but it's just as valuable at a national or sub-national stage for health professionals to engage in this way. One um, thing that we took away from our engagement as, at this UN Climate Conference was that there was a big remaining gap um, in terms of building long-term capacity in between these key moments for the health community, um, as well as bringing that engagement at, that in, at those international fora back down to national and sub-national engagement. And that's something that the US does really well and this consortium does really well, uh, but it's not present uh, or not as strong in some other countries. So in that sense, maybe we, some countries could learn from what the consortium, consortium has done and could maybe replicate something similar. Um, in, in the own country I work in, in Australia, we have something similar uh, called CAHA, which is the organization I work for, but many other countries don't have such a, a consortium set up. So that's, that's something that we can learn from you. And then my last slide, uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to just quickly um, make a point around the role of governments themselves to actually support, support the workforce uh, in dealing with the impacts of climate change and to help the workforce build capacity. And on this slide, you see the results of a survey that uh, we've done with the World Health Organization and that we do every two years or so, where we actually go directly to the ministries of health of all countries, all our member states. Uh, and we ask them how well they're doing on uh, climate change and health. And we also look ourselves at, at their exi existing climate plans and the climate and health plans. And on the slide here, you see a summary of um, all countries, their national climate plans. and. Um, the different building blocks that they've included in their plans um, that help support their uh, health systems to be climate resilient. And so you, there's 10 lines here. It's not, we won't go over all of them, but it's just useful to know that there's 10 different building blocks that we're working with um, or that WHO considers as necessary to build a climate resilient health system. Um, and one big gap that always gets pointed out is finance. And that's at the bottom here, the low, lowest one. And we, we always notice that finance for um, the health system to actually deal with climate change is extremely limited and you see also it's, it's almost non-existent there's only a few national climate plans worldwide that actually provide proper finance for the health system to to deal with things and that the other big gap and that's often a little bit forgotten is the health workforce so if you want to build a, a health system that can deal with climate change of course you have to invest in your workforce you have to train them you have to provide capacity building um, and that is just often not included at all uh, including the US climate plan doesn't uh, include this at all. There's no, no long-term vision on how to prepare the health workforce um, in deal for dealing in dealing with climate change. So that's a, a massive gap that we're, we're aware of and trying to uh, rectify, but th there's a big role for governments themselves. So I think what we've seen today is how much the health workforce themselves is doing already. Um, but of course we should also demand more from our governments and not on this slide, but also it, like equally important is the role that subnational governments can play, of course, in improving the health systems. And that's something that um, I think, in my opinion, we've seen very clearly with the COVID-19 pandemic, where quite a lot of states have actually stood up and shown health leadership in trying to protect the health of their populations. And it's sort of my personal hope that um, they're, they're now emboldened and they will also act more ambitiously uh, to protect the health of their citizens from climate change. Uh, but that's maybe wishful thinking. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I hope we can also have a bit of a Q&A. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you all so much for um, your wonderful presentations. And um, the time is very limited. And we have our, our national speaker at the top of the hour. So I'm going to choose the moderator's um, prerogative to say, the speakers are all listed. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to them in a different venue and take care of yourselves right now. Take a breather, come back um, for the national speaker. Thank you all very much. <laughs>